Hi, Bruce. How are you? Hello, Nupur. Yes, doing all right. Pulling along as best okay. as can be expected, given everything that's going on. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Thank you for having me. It's really nice to have you here. So as you know, we're talking about this segment that's called That Job Rocks. It's okay. a special Hoopster segment that we're doing to create awareness about alternate careers. Uh, besides the traditional ones that usually we know people that people do or those careers which, you know, bring forth the question, Acha, you're doing this, but what is your real job? Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we're looking so. at uh, telling people that, you know, even these alternate careers can be, can be something that you can gain success in. And mm -hmm. we're trying to understand what parents can do to encourage kids and help them get started. Right. So okay. quite obviously, when we're talking to you, we're going to be talking about uh, music. Mm -hmm. You're one of... So for those of you who do not know, we are here with Mr. Bruce Lee Money. He has an amazing academy called Tacademy. He's the co-founder of it. And their band, Thermal and a Quarter, is I think one of the most successful bands in our country today. I remember even as when I was in college, I used to go attend their shows, watch their shows and everything. This is the part where she makes me feel old. <laughs> Mm. So we used to go attend their shows and he's himself a singer, a songwriter and also a guitarist. So was this your career all along? Did you, did you start with music and stick to music or did, was it something else and then a switch over? How did it happen? Oh, um, yeah, I've many times across my life, uh, not maybe in the last five or ten years or so, but before that I've got this question and people say, so what do you do? And then I say, I'm a musician. Then they say, okay, but what do you do? You know, right. uh, so that question has come to me many times. Uh, but to answer your question about, uh, was music always my first thing? No, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, I in fact spent most of my school years up to, I guess, 11th standard or PUC as we, as we call it here, mm -hmm. uh, wanting to be a fighter pilot. That's, uh, that's what I really wanted to be. I, I was obsessed with aircraft. I was obsessed with flying and it was everything that I wanted to do. So music was definitely not on any kind of horizon. Uh, all I wanted to do was fly, you know, MiG-25s. So, <laughs> uh, but things changed in, um, you know, in my 11th and 12th standard. And uh, I happened to meet some in important people, I guess, in, in terms of this transformation into the career I'm in right now in college. And I got sucked into just playing a lot of music. I, I, I joined the college band. We took part in a lot of competitions. And uh, very early on, we started to also kind of write music. It was, it was kind of, it was initially done to win college competitions because we were the only band at that point that had any points in the originality column that the judges had. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, we used to win competitions in the strength of our own music. And so writing music became kind of a habit from, I'd say, the mid, uh, 90, 90, from 96, 97 itself, when, when the band started, we were already writing music. And I guess that's a kind of addiction you don't easily recover from. Uh, the thing about creating your own thing and, you know, finding, just finding an outlet for that expression. Uh, but getting out of college in 2000, which is, wow, 20 years ago now, man, I am old. Uh, <laughs> uh, but getting out of college in 2000, it really wasn't a viable option. It was something you did if, you know, you had enough uh, funds from your family that would uh, keep you going for a few years while you found your, you know, way in the field of music or whatever. But if you had to, you know, start accepting your responsibilities and providing for yourself, at that point, if you wanted to do music full time, then you had to do, you were, your options were limited, shall we say. It wasn't impossible to do music full time, but your options were limited. And uh, an option was, one of the options was definitely not forming your own rock band and making your own music and trying to, you know, sell it to a niche audience. That was definitely not on the cards to be a sustainable kind of career. So if you wanted to make a career for music at that point, 20 years ago, you had to be working in the jingle industry, making mm. advertising jingles. Mm. Uh, you could try and make an entry into writing music for film, but it's, it's a crowded space there and there's lots of established players. So getting in there is not an easy thing. And it takes years to work your way up to a point when you're, again, sustainable as a career, mm. right? Um, so those were the options uh, open at that point if you wanted to be a full-time musician. An option uh, at that, uh, even back then, was teaching. So if you wanted to teach music, uh, that was always uh, uh, open as an option. But uh, in terms of what you could earn back then from just teaching music, 
you would you would, it would be like a you know like a teacher salary kind of thing which if it, right. which if it was adequate for you at that point was fantastic it's a great right. career to be right. a teacher and i'm still a music teacher i love doing that it's uh, teaching is definitely one of the things that musicians have to do around the world to keep going but uh, yeah so to if that answers your question it it wasn't the first thing and i spent uh, 10 years after that from 2000 2010 in various corporate careers uh and i'd say careers because i did all kinds of different things it wasn't just one career and it's only in 2010 that i became a full time musician so obviously like you said there were no uh, avenues for you to succeed back then and it was not so easy for you to make it i don't know how it is today because i'm not in the industry but uh making that decision what kind of reactions did, did it get from people around you when you said okay this is it i'm done i'm only going to do music from today what was the reaction like Well, like I said, by the time it was 2010, um, we're already uh, well. To give you some history about it, in 2002, uh, I started work in 2009. I, my my first job was at uh, India.com, India.com. Yeah, uh, my first job was I, I stepped out of my master's degree uh, in media and communications uh, into a job at India.com. I was working on their uh, on the music part of the well, on of the website. It's a portal, right? So I was writing all the music articles, writing reviews, uh, uh, going to concerts, things like that. So it was enjoyable work, uh, but that was my first job. And um, around 2002. uh we decided to quit i decided to quit uh, work in fact the whole band uh, terminal and quarter the band we decided to quit together right so in a show of in a show of solidarity we said we'd all quit our jobs and we'd do music full time and the band would take us places and we we were going to win the next grammy and all of that all of that crap right so uh, we did that in 2002 and i just gotten married so you can imagine how well that went down mm-hmm. with the family saying wow you you just you just did this and now you're saying you're quitting work you know uh, i i must say that i had a lot of support from uh, the family it wasn't you know the way i mentioned it, but it's fun to say that <laughs> but uh, but obviously people are apprehensive saying great i mean we support you but are you sure you can do this you know is it possible uh, well needless to say it took i think a little short of 9 or 10 months in 2002 to realize that we were broke and we couldn't make this happen also because we were trying to do it just with the band right and mm-hmm. the quarter as a band we don't make mainstream pop music we make a kind of oddball bangalore rock as we call it so we write only we play only our own music we don't play covers we don't do right. you know we are like we are in terms of uh, you know uh, a marked for a commercial success kind of thing that's not us we you know we are, we want to be artists we want to <laughs> express ourselves we want to do things like that yeah. so uh, it is always going to be difficult uh, right. and it definitely wasn't the time at that point in 2002 for a band to do that uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the country wasn't just ready for something like that to happen mm-hmm. and so yeah we, in in 9 months we all crawled back to our jobs and uh, it took 8 years after that to quit again and say now we, we've got it right and we're going to get it happen so uh, when speaking about your journey itself now when our child goes to parents and says okay you know what mom or dad i want to have a career in music the first reaction is okay you do your graduation you study you finish everything and then do whatever the hell you want okay that's what they tell you uh, sometimes i think that probably the child could be studying that something that really interests them and sure. probably get better then spend 4 5 years doing something they don't like and then start off and then again build their skills what are your views on that is a plan b really important uh i'd say at one point it was uh, 20 years ago i'd say uh, it was because it was much more uncertain than it is now it's still uncertain any career in the arts mm-hmm. uh, and i want to emphasize the word art here in the sense that making it a distinction from uh art scene in a commercial sense like i said you know making music for films making music for ad jingles things like that commercial music and artistic music i want to make that distinction uh and so if you want to pursue a career in the arts you have to be ready to accept the fact that it's going to be hard right so unless uh, you know uh and there are a few people who get lucky who you know generate something artistically that immediately becomes commercially successful and therefore they have you know right. uh, from very early on in their artistic careers they have uh, a commercial success as well but mm-hmm. even that is not a guarantee that it's going to continue for the rest of your life right you have right. ups and downs right. and so on so right. so uh, as a general rule of thumb it helps to equip yourself 
in hmm. the best possible way for uh, your pursuit so if you want to you know take up an art form as your career then it would make sense to spend some time studying it properly systematically hmm. in an organized way uh, and 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 get as much you know uh, insight and uh, an exposure to hmm. the art form that you want to pursue which was right. not really possible uh 20 years ago right right i could not walk into a christ college and now you couldn't get it right mm -hmm. so uh, especially in western music if you want to do karnataka music where you could go and get a qualification available there was what so what do you do you can't get qualified so and you end up with doing okay so what's the closest thing i can do a ba i can do something you know i can keep uh, doing some graduation while i parallelly study music on my heart that was because you can't even you know google something and go to youtube and learn something you have to learn everything yourself now Right. right so uh christ college for example right now has a bachelor's degree in music right hmm. which is amazing so they right. have faculty from all over the world you can you can study music again in a systematic organized way and come out with a bachelor's degree in music right hmm. so what you do after that of course there are lots of things we can talk about but it's now possible to uh, to get those qualifications and even if you don't want a bachelor's degree if you just want to be certified for uh, an instrument right say you want to play piano or you want to play guitar or you want to play ukulele even whatever you can actually get an internationally valid certification in that instrument okay mm -hmm. and then use that to make a career for yourself in some way or the other right it's possible to do those things so mm -hmm. yeah a lot of realities have changed since the time you guys started and so tell me one thing um now like i said before you're one of the few bands that actually went globally performed in different countries uh bruce i think we lost you hello no i'm still here yeah yeah there you are so yeah. uh like i said you're one of the few indian bands that actually went all over the world you performed for an international audience and all of that what yeah. was something that you did probably right or something that you did differently that helped you achieve that success I'd say it wasn't one thing; it was many things. And I must here again uh, say that uh, one of the things we did right was that we, thanks to our work in the corporate world, thanks to our work with organizations, we we learned how to work in this industry. Right now, just because you're pursuing a career in the arts doesn't mean you don't have to work. You can't just be an artist for 24 hours. It doesn't do anything. Right? right so it doesn't matter what art you want to pursue you still need a work ethic you still need to know how to organize people you still need to know how to organize your finances you still need to know how to raise funds if you need money you still need to know how to engage not just with your audience for your art but also with an audience of people who might be willing to support you or or sponsor you or things like that so there there's a whole bunch of things you have to learn to enable yourself to pursue your art right so just saying that oh i am an artist i can't be bothered with uh, you know talking business i can't be bothered with excel sheets i can't be bothered with making ppts it doesn't help right again if you are one of those uh, unicorns who somehow the first thing they do becomes a, a rabid commercial success then great for you fantastic i mean awesome uh, more power to you but that's not the case with most people who try and you know uh, a career in the arts right hmm. so you need to learn to work and that learning to work is something that doesn't come easy you have to mm -hmm. work to understand how to work right, right you have right. to work in an organization you have to know what it is to work with people like for example i'm a musician and i'm not a solo musician i work with a band which means there are four other people involved and uh, the, the the four people here have to find a way to creatively work with each other Hmm. that's actually creating the art that we that we that we do hmm. we also have to learn to work with each other professionally which means right. that uh, are, so we are a company right we need to form into some kind of entity or an organization which means that we have roles in the company which means that we have to decide on salaries we have to decide on how we are sharing the money that we make or, or we need to make business decisions as to okay what is our strategy are we going to do market this way are you going to go this way are you going to follow trends are we going to stick just to what we want to do so there's a lot of this kind this, this um, you know this kind of uh, thought process and uh, uh, an understanding that you need to have if you want to have a chance of success right mm -hmm. you can't just say i i am i make the most fantastic art and therefore 
I am entitled to a career. It doesn't work. Right, right, right. right. Absolutely. Uh, now, see, when you're doing any traditional job, suppose I'm getting into an IT company or I'm getting into some sort of a journalism uh, business, something like that, there are options for us to do some internship. You know, I can go somewhere, you know, work somewhere, get some on, on ground experience and all of that. What options like that does a person who is trying to get into the music industry have? Is there any apprenticeship? Is there any sort of internship? How do they learn these skills? Right now, there are tons. So if you want to understand the music industry, for example, so what, what is the industry? I mean, if you, you can think about music industry as being uh, the creators who are the musicians themselves. Uh, then there are the uh, events, events part of it, which is all the live performances, things like that. There's a whole, there's a whole industry built around live events, live artistic events. It could be music, dance, theater, whatever it is, right? So mm-hmm. there's a whole industry around the event space, and there's a whole industry around the uh, the recorded or the or the information space, which is like music is information. There's a way in which it is consumed by people. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole industry built around that. There's a whole industry around which uh, you know uh, uh, a dance or theater is is recorded and and disseminated. Right? There's a whole industry around that. So there are different parts. Uh, so these mm-hmm. are, let's just break. There are many more, of course. But let's for simplicity's sake, there's the performance aspect, there's the events aspect, and there's the industry aspect. So there are these three things that uh, exist. And so if you just you know do a little bit of research as to okay, so who are the big biggest event firms? Who are the uh, who are the biggest uh, you know uh, online distributors of of content? Who are the uh, most successful artists who are working right now, right? Mm-hmm. And you'll find that they've got ecosystems kind of building around them. For example, um, the school that I run, Tech Academy, we've had many interns come and work with us uh, to understand what the music education space is all about, right? And uh, through interning with us, they have met many of our faculty who are, you know, gigging professional musicians. Uh, they get to understand what their lives are like, how they how they have to you know balance their uh, performance uh, with their teaching. Uh, they meet a lot of students, and so they understand you know uh, that many students are there just for a hobby. Some are more passionate; they want to take music as a career, uh, and you know that's that kind of interaction really gives you a more holistic view of what it's like from this artistic education hmm. performance kind of perspective. Right? Right. So that's there. If you want to get into the events industry, maybe you want to intern with an event company like. Like say Wiscraft or uh, DNA or something like that. You go and actually understand what it takes to put a live event together. Right? Mm-hmm. There's tons of things that happen behind the scenes that people don't really, you know, uh, are not really aware of. And mm-hmm. you know, thanks to our conditioning with our Bollywood films, we think that you know, when somebody sings, music just happens. It just <laughs> appears. Right? Things just happen. Suddenly there will be strings. Suddenly there will be horns. You know, <laughs> but there's a there's a whole lot of work that goes beyond you know what you see on stage. And there's a whole lot of people you never see who are doing that work. Right? You never see those people on stage. But there's a lot of stuff happening behind. So what does it take to put together a live event? What does it take to uh, to get to get a band to sound really good? Uh, mm-hmm. So that's you can you can you can work with that. Then talking about the dissemination of the content itself, Spotify, Apple Music, Savan, Ghana, there are so many of these things right now. So if you want to understand how that part of the industry works, go and you know find a contact in there, go and do some free internships, learn how that how that space works. How does how does music content or artistic content, how uh, uh, you know, uh, sending it out to the consumers, how does that make money for the business? How does it make money for the artist? What is the what are the mechanisms involved? There's a ton of stuff to learn, right? right. So, uh, and if you want to be an artist, uh, you actually need to understand a little bit of all these things. You can't mm-hmm. only be focused on the performance aspect or only on the distribution aspect. You need to understand events. You need to understand. Uh, 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 you know, so streaming or, or, or that. You need to understand what it is to actually create your music and sell it. So you need to actually be, you know, pretty much on top of many of these things. You really have to have, you know, a, a multi-dimensional kind of education and ability. So it's it's quite a challenge, but it's, it's mm. amazing and it's so interesting. That is true. And what can parents do to give their kids a head start? You know, what what are the some what are some things that they can teach them, or what are the what are some paths that they can take to help children? get a head start or get started in the industry. So again, so if, if, for example, if the child wants to be an artist, say she, a child wants to be a dancer or wants to be a, a musician or wants to be an actor, say, uh, um, so obviously through school, uh, finding the school that has, 
uh, a good music program or a good theater program or a good dance program that has you know good professionals working in the school to help the kids really uh, get into uh, music not just as a extra class but with some level of seriousness so you learn structure you learn aesthetic right now these are things that we did not have when we were growing up in school for me music class was uh, you know a music teacher coming with a harmonium and us singing two bhajans which we all hated after the first you know five minutes of listening to them because that was not a music we were listening to and it didn't really excite us or make us feel that we wanted to learn more about this music also because we were not told about the beauty of those songs even it was just okay here's a song let's sing it huh. that's not teaching music right? right i have this i have this problem even now with the way art is taught in all our schools right a lot of the art teaching is okay art class draw is that teaching art is drawing learning how to draw is that learning art no there's a lot more to learning about art it's not just okay here's an apple draw the apple hmm. i mean so what if you can't draw an apple what if you are in your perspective the apple is like something you just don't want to draw hmm. <coughs> and you want to explore something else about art right so you need to learn whatever art you are studying you need to learn first hmm. an aesthetic right what is balance what is proportion what is contrast what is dynamic what is that's the stuff that if you are taught from a young age hmm. then when you get to the point when you can assimilate the actual technique of the art itself you are much you are in a much better position to really explore that art in a more deeper and meaningful way right hmm. so hmm. if you are not given any training for aesthetic in the beginning itself then you are like floundering you don't know what to do right right so that's one of the things that you know as academy uh, we've really tried to put together across the last 7 years we've been working in about 13 15 schools in the city and we've put together a, a music program that basically does this which provides a kind of holistic view of the art form of music mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so learning to play music is uh, learning music is not learning to play an instrument or learning to sing that's Correct. just one one small part of music right mm-hmm. but what makes music enjoyable what is the aesthetic of music what is a, what is a pop song what is a rock song what is a classical song what is a what is a what is a you know carnatic classical versus hindustani classical versus western classical versus uh, jazz versus blues what what do all these things mean do you really have context do you have perspective do you understand you know what uh, music is from a different from a from a deeper viewpoint than just okay i like this song right mm-hmm. so can you do that and that's been our objective to try and give this deeper thing from grade 1 mm-hmm. and and the amazing thing is that even at age 6 children are are quite open to this stuff and they understand it you know if you if you tell them in the correct way if you have the right techniques if you have the right syllabus and the right uh, people to do it for you they understand this mm-hmm. right? if, uh, most of the time people say how can you teach uh, a 6 year old you can you know when i when i do a guitar class for a 6 year old i am talking about the physics of vibrating strings i am talking about uh, you know uh, resonation uh, resonating and i'm talking about uh, hertz and i'm talking about frequency and they love it because yeah. i mean as human beings the, the biggest thing we have is this desire to learn we are curious we want to yeah. understand things and from the beginning yeah. if you are stimulated in that way then you will find that you know they really they and, and they get addicted to that form of learning right which is again something that we really need to see in our schools and and i wish more art education had this kind of perspective right so like for my daughter who's in fifth grade her art class is this okay draw right but it would be really good for an art class to talk about okay colors now how do colors make you feel right when you see a particular combination of colors do, does it make you think of something does it that it does it make an emotion or does it give you an emotional response right so let's look at proportion now when i have you know two colors one is of two thirds one is one third one is half one is half what is more pleasing to your eye you know so these are questions that if you ask even a very young child they can start developing tick oh okay so this is art this is an understanding of color of proportion of contrast of dynamics of of movement you know so these are fascinating things to, to really teach even young children right? right and so for parents i mean it's really great if you are able to find these kind of teachers for your your kids you know who can give you this kind of perspective right to give you a little bit and and the fact is no child is too young for this that's the yeah. thing you know many people right. think that oh i have to wait till uh, i'm 13 to really start uh, looking at music theory and aesthetic no you can understand aesthetic at age 5 you can right yeah. it's just about how it's done right? right so yeah find find those uh, places where your child can dig deeper into the art form that uh, 
either and in the beginning many kids don't even know what art form they want to get into right they're influenced by things they see on media on youtube or tv or they, oh that that the drummer looks okay so cool. i want to play drums <laughs> oh i saw that painting it's a beautiful i want to paint right mm-hmm. and many kids want to do many things simultaneously they want to paint they want to play drums they want to dance they want to act they want to do everything right which is great they should be allowed to do everything but let's try and give them uh, uh these things to do in a slightly deeper way than just okay go to a drawing class go to yeah. if you're going then i hopefully the drawing class is doing a little bit more than just making them draw right because mm. that's that's one part but there should be more right uh guys if you have any question i see some of you in the audience please type them out in the chat box and we'll get back to it so please if you have any questions you can ask bruce uh so now summing up uh, summing up the thing about the school arts program what uh, i know you told us in a lot of detail what are some things that will make an art program in school solid what are some aspects that you would like to add to it so like i said I, it's an art program shouldn't be focused on just getting kids to execute the art because mm-hmm. that's that's one part of it but it can't be a dog and pony show where it's like uh, okay you've learned uh, to act so you must do a, a play every year and that play will be you know stayed somewhere and that is your learning mm-hmm. right when you study acting if you study theater then you have to study a little bit about the voice you have to study about projection you have to study about emotion you have to study about you know getting into a character or what what a role is you have to study about you know the interactions between people and you know behavioral things and again these things can be understood by even very young children you don't have to wait for them to be in 10th grade to explain these kind of deeper things children are you know very intuitive and they intuitively grasp new things i mean adults have difficulty in learning right they intuitively get this thing about role playing because they're always acting there and and the thing is they have so few inhibitions right the older you get the more inhibited you are and therefore you don't allow yourself to express you know things that may be in your mind as honestly as a child does right <laughs> so it's like there's no it's it's never too young to have this and so the insistence should be can we get a little deeper more organized with this and let it not only be about performance because yeah. the the pressure of performance sometimes uh makes makes any art education very you know one dimensional mm-hmm. it's like you're learning you're learning music because there is a there is a show at the end of the year you have to play two songs so the whole year you will work on those two songs right okay. at the end of the year you will play those songs very well but you will know nothing else right huh. so huh. it's like is a bit pointless and, and that's why even sometimes these exams that you do with music mm they good they really good they uh they kind of uh <clears throat> they establish a rigor they give you a qualification all those things are there but if you do only exams then it's kind of again defeats the purpose because then you only know those exam pieces you only can play those songs you can't do anything else and therefore it it's just it defeats the purpose you're not learning music you're basically passing exams right? right so there has to be that holistic view and that's really important we have a question from sogata hari she asked yes um who were your teachers and inspirations in your earliest days who were your teachers and inspirations in the earliest days <laughs> well i like i said in in school i wasn't uh, really doing much uh, with music but i must say uh, the teachers that really kind of um you know lit that spark in terms of there's more to learning than just a textbook and knowledge and information right mm-hmm. the learning is more about information learning is about understanding perspective context all those things uh, i'd say there was an english teacher in uh, from 7th grade to 10th grade her name was ratan she was one of uh, a very inspiring teacher mm-hmm. and uh, again she she went she taught us english but she went deeper than just the lesson you know there was so much about the language and the love for the language itself that came from our classes um then in college again uh, english teachers journalism teachers maybe one chemistry teacher uh maybe one math teacher but it's it's really i mean it's sad that i can count these inspiring teachers on one hand it's like you know they um it's not easy to find unfortunately <laughs> there's a long question uh, i'm going to read it out okay music yeah. has always been this one thing that i love to do without any kind of hesitation this is from girija uh, mm-hmm. but the thought of failing in this industry is extremely scary uh, <laughs> that too with this mindset of indian so what is it that we should do to know that there is nothing to fear about 
and what is it that we should do to know that music is really the field for me wow okay that's complex <laughs> So with any art form, Girija, it's uh, this fear of failure, fear of the fact that, you know, your artistic creations may not be appreciated by other people as much as you appreciate them yourself is always there. And uh, even after, you know, 24 years of being in a band, when we write a song and when we put it out and, or when we play it live, that first performance is still a nerve wracking because you're like, Okay, we love this. We have have all signed off on it. We totally trip how we are, how this sounds and everything. But is the audience going to like it? You know, we're going to play it, and you never know, right? And sometimes the the the, the bits of work that you uh, that you put out that you're not really that convinced about. You say that yeah, I, I made that song, or I I, I I I you know I delivered that performance, and I it wasn't my greatest. Sometimes those are the ones that audiences really like. You know, so just this last year, there was we put out this album called "The World Gone Mad," and there's a song there called uh, "Lopsided." Um, that you know, when we wrote it, also it's like it's a good song, but I don't think this has hit potential. Then there's another song called "Stone Circle," which is this really mellow, long, slow ballad. It's about eight minutes, seven minutes long, and we were like, "Yeah, this is only going to be enjoyed by you know a few people who like this kind of thing." And those are the two songs that are the biggest in that album. Right, they've been streamed 350,000 times. They're like people all over the country talking about it. They're like, so you don't know, right? Sometimes what you think is your best work is not what your audience thinks is your best work, <laughs> right? So it's uh, it's it, it that's the, and that's the courage aspect of being in any art artistic endeavor, which is that you have to develop that, which is that you have to be you have to have a thick skin because people are going to say all kinds of things, and even your own fans, people who like your work. Will sometimes you know completely hate something you do, and so you need to have a thick skin, which is there is a certain amount of feedback that you will take. But beyond that, you have to say, "Hey, I do this, and I'm not going to like completely transform myself based on the feedback you give me. I accept it. I take what you're saying, but hey, I, I'm still doing my stuff, right? And I'm growing, I'm evolving, and uh, I'm going to do it, right? So the fear of failure always going to be there. Never going to get away from that. Uh, just you know, keep your heart in your mouth, uh, gird those loins and just go for it. That's it. <laughs> There's nothing else to say. <laughs> so there you go, Girija. Just go for it. Okay. Don't be scared. Just go for it. <laughs> and uh, then, now, um, see, there is this thing that, you know, in India alone, we have this stigma around <laughs> art. But is it really true? Because I'm pretty sure that Everywhere in the world, there is some fear when it comes to the art because it's not an easy industry to be in. How bad yeah. are we and how do you have any experience in that? Area? So, I mean, uh, having, like you said, you know, traveled and played in many different parts of the world, I'd have to say that uh, with, with, with arts in particular, it's actually quite similar. It's mm -hmm. not uh, a huge difference in terms of... Uh, um, you know, how it's perceived and how it's uh, accepted and so on. Um, the, the difference, however, is that, you know, with an arts education, now I think it's, it's changing for the, for, the, for the worse around the world as well. But uh, an arts education was given more kind of uh, more importance uh, in many other countries apart from India. Uh, and, you know, pursuing that, uh, um, that vision of an arts education, of a holistic arts education that's deep and wide, uh, was, I guess, done better in other places. Uh, our arts education has been, I think, apart from select institutions where you, you know, uh, that have, you know, stood the test of time and you can go there and you know that you're going to get a good arts education, but general arts education in, in every government school, in every elite school or whatever, can we have an arts program that's truly meaningful? That really doesn't exist in this country. And that's, I think, a big drawback. And that's one of the reasons why this stigma of, uh, not, not stigma, this kind of perception that uh, there's no value in this. You know, you can't generate value out of art. Correct. You can generate value out of engineering, out of law, out of medicine, out of other things, architecture, even whatever. But generating value out of art is not, uh, uh, not such a, uh, uh, you know, easy thing. Yeah. Also, because some the, you know, and this might be a, uh, it's an interesting cultural perspective to talk about. Um, but in terms of artistic expression itself, if you look at our classical music, 
uh, Hindustani music, Carnatic classical music, if you truly analyze them. Uh, for the longest part, they, <clears throat> they've been the domain of kind of the intelligentsia, the, the elites in a way. But even there, you know, a lot of classical musicians barely get by. They're not, you know, super wealthy people. They're not, they not paid commensurate with the effort that they put in. Right. And somehow because uh, and the music itself in many ways, Carnatic classical music, for example, uh, uh, now, of course, things are changing across the last 50 years. A lot of changes have happened. But before that, it was it was considered that it was, it was almost like a devotional thing to do. Right. You did it because you uh, wanted to praise. Uh, um, <clears throat> Sorry, Girija is asking another question. I got distracted. But yeah, yeah. essentially, it was the music was perceived as its own reward. Hmm. And the fact that, hey, you are doing this, so you are so absorbed in it, so that itself should be enough. Why should I pay you any money? Right? So, yeah. anyway, you're having fun. Right? Huh. So, <laughs> so and, and that kind of attitude, I guess, is something that is very deep seated in our culture in the sense that we don't place enough value on the arts. Right? So that uh, I will pay 500 rupees for a beer. But I will not come to your concert and pay 200 rupees for a ticket. I want it for free. Or give me a, give me a free pass, please. Right? I will go out and pay 500 rupees for that one glass of drink. But I will not pay that much for your concert. Because I, deep down, I don't ascribe it the same value. Hmm. That is true. Right? And that is something that is coming from, you know, from a very young age. It is that conditioning that... You know, uh, no, this is all meaningless. It, 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 there's no value in it. Hmm, 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 hmm. And that has to change. I really yeah. think that has to change. Uh, this this brings, brings me... Grija will come back to your question in just a second. But let, before I lose my train of thought, this brings bring me to one question, Ruth. When somebody starts off in the music industry or any dance, arts, or whatever, and they're trying to book a gig or they're trying to get a spot to play or something like that. There are two kinds of things that happen. One is they say, ha, exposure ke liye tum karo, you'll build a portfolio. That is one thing. And the second thing is when a person grows and realizes, okay, I have some value. Yeah, I've been adding some value to your shows. You know, you need to pay me something. And the person quotes, oh, this person thinks, you know, he's too high and mighty. This is something that happens. How does somebody, yes. since you've been, uh, since I think you guys have done a lot of shows and everything, how do you break that? Because that's really hard for somebody who's young to... How do you how do you value yourself? This is your price. How do you put a price on yourself? How do you because that is very important as a business. So how do you decide that? You know, I mean, it's a it's a it's a sad enough statistic. But after twenty four years of doing it, it still happens to us. You know, uh, where you know when especially when you know um, again the the perceived value of what you do is also connected to a kind of meta uh, thing around it. Like, for example, we are a rock band, right? So we play English music, hmm. uh, which already is like, oh, so you are aping the West. You are not doing culture. You, you, are, you, are, not, you are not connected to our tradition. You are, you know, you are some Western fellow. All that kind of stuff. Even though, you know, we, we call our music Bangalore rock. Uh, I, I, I can't apologize for the fact that I think in English and I express myself best in English. That's who I am. That's how, how it happened for me, right? I went to an English school. It wasn't my choice to go to an English school. It was, it happened, right? It wasn't my choice that my parents uh, spoke English and read a lot of English books and, mm. and, there, and so on. So that's a long story there. But uh, essentially, um, you know, so if you compare us, for example, with a band that plays Bollywood music, Right now, Bollywood music uh, as a meta thing has much greater commercial appeal than you know uh, what we do. Yeah. Right? Simply because the mass audience uh, has it has a lot more reach with that mass audience. So, if for example we are we are competing for a for the same event with a band that does Bollywood songs, and we are a band that does only you know our own original music as well as maybe some popular songs from Western bands that we like or other Indian bands that we like and so on. There is straight away a huge value differential, right? Mm. Even if even if the client, for example, wants an English band, uh, wants uh, you know something that's more Western flavored, if you want to call it that, there is always this thing about oh, there might be two or three people in the audience who want Bollywood. Will you play that also? And if we say no, look, that doesn't go with our artistic identity. It doesn't make sense. Then immediately your value comes down. Mm. When actually it should go up. Hmm. When it's like you're, you're you're taking a stance, saying that hey, I have an artistic identity and I want to keep that. So therefore, this is what it costs for that. If you want that identity, right? Hmm. 
and that's where the problem comes with the market because sometimes the market is not interested in an artistic identity they just want something right i don't care actually i don't care who is playing as long as somebody is playing right? right and if that somebody has a brand that makes some sense okay i'll pay a little more for it right it is not really a, a a real evaluation of artistic merit or anything it is just a, a very superficial uh, kind of evaluation of that and that again is coming from the same lack of education people aren't educated with right. what is artistic value what is artistic merit right mm-hmm. so it's a very grassroots problem it's very hard to solve right mm-hmm. so to, uh, to to truly get to address the issue like you might never get to a point when um, you quote a price and people just say oh okay yeah i believe you're worth that and you now i'll give it to you right it happens to us uh, uh, more often now than it used to happen before and it's great it feels good saying that yeah somebody understands what we are doing and why you know we have this price and so on um but it will also equally happen that uh, you know people are, are are shopping and they're just you know getting your thing and they're not really interested in what you're doing they're just trying to understand okay what your what your price is right so uh, it's a game you have to learn to play it you have to right. learn to play it and learning to play it is only out of experience there are no there is no playbook there is no rules that you can follow saying do this when this happens do that when something else happens no it is completely individual you have to understand how to craft an entity you have to understand when to say no and when to come down and say okay i will do this for this thing because there is something in it for me as well right mm-hmm. and that is a reality that you have to come to grips with only by yourself uh, or the group that you're working with so there is there there's no playbook but expect it to happen pretty much throughout your artistic career <laughs> <laughs> so uh, besides the money aspect i mean of course important what yes. are some things that would make an artist what are some instances where you can compensate okay this show can give me some value so maybe i'll bring my price down what are some learning moments when you're performing are there is there anything like that at all like this show can is an opportunity for me to learn i'm talking about really young people who are starting out so uh, as a young uh, as a young artist i see one of the things that um, you know i was talking about um, working having a corporate kind of life for 10 years right Nope. Uh, Bruce, can you hear me? I think your screen is frozen. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, I'm back. Are you back? Yes, I'm back too. <laughs> yes. All right. Yes. Momentary so disconnections. Right. Yeah. So I was talking about um, what were you talking about? We're talking about how what they can look for in a gig. Suppose they don't yes. have. Yes. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> so this uh, I was talking about yeah our careers. Mm-hmm. So having you know a source of income that is not. always directly connected with the art you are trying to practice mm-hmm. uh, can be quite a liberating thing because then you can take chances with this mm-hmm. but if you are fully dependent on only your art to provide for you right and mm-hmm. after after a point it's not just you you might have a family you might have you know emis to pay uh, kids to put uh, put through school things like that and those things are relentless right they don't give you a break it's not like right. one couple of months you have bad months you can't stop that stuff it, it's yeah. relentless it, it goes on right yeah. so uh, having some sustainability with maybe an alternate uh, source of income is sometimes very useful in those in those beginning years right it allows you to experiment with many different things it allows you to stay true to uh, what you really uh, to, to straight stay true to your artistic vision without having to compromise it just to earn money Right? so because otherwise what happens to many artists who you know and this is true for many artists who don't get that lucky break in the beginning mm-hmm. of their careers itself right mm-hmm. slog right you keep trying you keep trying different things and sometimes you are forced to compromise on your artistic vision to a dangerous degree just to assure commerce right 
So, mm. and then after a while, it's a slippery slope from there. So, once you make a compromise that you would not have been ordinarily willing to make, maybe, mm. if, you know, before this, once you do that, then it's like, I've done this, so big deal, I may as well do something else. And after a while, you've lost sight of your artistic vision completely. And you're doing something, you know, that you didn't, didn't think you were going to do ever. And maybe you're not very really happy with it. And then it puts you in a bad frame of mind. And then you, you know, you have all these, you hate what you do. And then it becomes like, you might as well be in some, you know, drone job where you hate what you do anyway. <laughs> you know? right. So that's a slippery slope. It's a scary thing to happen. Right. So, uh, so if you have, if you have those kind of, you know, illusions of having an artistic vision and you want to satisfy that, then at least when you're getting started for the first few years that you're really experimenting with this, it's good to have some kind of sustainable income from another source that allows you a degree of freedom, and allows you a degree of, uh, uh, <coughs> allows you to not make those difficult compromises. Hmm. Hmm. Right? So for us, for example, those first 10 years when we had jobs, I mean, uh, except for that one nine month thing that I told you about, uh, <laughs> I mean, we had, we had careers and so we took only the gigs that were the most ideal for us. Mm. We didn't have to take gigs where we knew we'd be playing to people that didn't care about what we were doing, where, uh, you know, we would just be on the side somewhere and nobody really gave us, gave a shit about what we were doing. We, we didn't have to do that right? because it wasn't important. Right? right. And we could also stay completely true to our artistic vision. We could do whatever the heck we wanted with our music. Okay, if you want to incorporate uh, fusion, let's do it. We want to do jazz, let's do it. We want to do prog, let's do it. You are big deal, not telling us what to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And anyway, we are not completely dependent on this for our music, for our money. We, whatever extra comes is great. It's, it's a, like a bonus, right? Mm -hmm. So it really allowed us to, to, to craft that artistic identity, right? So at the end of, by the, by, by the mid, uh, the first decade of the 21st century, we pretty much had this, we were Bangalore rock, right? Mm -hmm. It took a while for that, and, and that's the thing with art, it takes time. Yeah. As soon as you start, you know, the first couple of years when you start playing an instrument or you start dancing, you don't have an identity yet. You're kind of just learning the ropes. It takes time. It's a lifelong thing. You know, it's, it's not even like 10 years, 20 years. It's your whole life you're doing this, right? Right. So, <laughs> so to give yourself that time to really explore what it is you're doing with your art, to craft your artistic identity, to develop an artistic vision that is meaningful, it's good to have that alternate source of income. Right. right. So right. Uh, it's uh, and like I said, if you are one of those gifted folks who the first thing they do just becomes amazing, then you don't need his advice at all. But right. if like most of us, you are it's a slog, right? You take years to actually achieve something. Right. Then I'd say this this makes sense. So that this is the right time to ask Girija's question. She says, "What is it that I should do to know that music is really the field for me?" So that's the thing. So uh, if you uh, if, first of all, you need to have some level of conviction internally that I really love this. I really want to do it. I want to give it my best shot, right? So you need to have that conviction. Uh, that's very important. Two, uh, if at, at, so if, if there's a period in your life when you know that, okay, I can manage to pay my bills uh, with something and whatever I do with my art is just a bonus. It helps and I get all together. It really makes sense. And that's a good position to be in. So basically you're assured of some basic and whatever comes as a result of your artistic practice is just a bonus and helps you more to, uh, uh, to further yourself in your art as well as in your career, then that's a good thing to do. Uh, and wait for that balance to tip. Essentially at one point you'll come to a point where, Hey, I can now do only my art and I can still sustain myself and it's great, you know, and that's when you decide this works, right? And then you jump. And you still have to be careful because, you know, at that point it might have all been working and everything is gung-ho and you're, you know, raking it in and you're making grand thing. And the next, the next artistic project you do bombs, right? <laughs> and it's like, wow, everybody hates it. And it's like panned by critics and whatever. And suddenly you're, you're lost and you don't know what you're doing anymore. This happens in many artists' lives, you know. Yeah. Uh, think about all those one-hit wonders as we call them. We dismiss them as one-hit wonders. All those bands who had just one massive hit and then mm. nobody remembers anything else about it which is so unfortunate i mean they might have been a great band they made some great music but for whatever reason that one song is all that people know <laughs> you yeah. know so how did they get through the rest of their lives are they still playing are they still performing are they doing other things who knows i mean it's different for different people but 
uh, be prepared for these kind of eventualities. Don't just think that at one point the balance tipped so the balance is going to stay that way all the time. It may not happen. If it does, great for you. Hmm. More power to you. But if it doesn't, be prepared again to have those other things to to flex and to and to be agile and and reinvent and refocus and all of that things. I mean, that's what it is to be an artist. Just be prepared for that. Right. So obviously, adaptability is very important as an artist, isn't it? Adapt, yes. being able to adapt is very, especially now that we had the pandemic. I yes. think the music and the entertainment industry, we suffer, I mean, they suffer the most. Absolutely. Is what I think. So how does one build, what, what are the uh, options to adapt in the music industry? Like, okay, I'm a performer, but now no gigs are happening. Nobody wants to come and watch shows because they're afraid. What are, what are the things that I can do to survive if I have decided, okay, okay this is what I'm going down. This is the path I'm going down. What all can I do to adapt? So, I mean, I, I can only give you my example, which is, again, we run Academy, which is a music school. Mm. And uh, so for the, you know, 40, 50 people that we employ, you are also full-time musicians. Mm. This basically saved us, right? So mm. it allowed us to, and we had to transform from a brick and mortar in-person uh, teaching business to a completely online business in basically Mr. Modiji's, you know, seven hours or something like that. We had to transform. Right. So he, he gave us that long to, to, to basically say, okay, our brick and mortar thing is done and we don't know for how long. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're just going to have to move everything online. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was just fortunate that what we do in terms of teaching translated reasonably well to online. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Even though the revenues are different and whatever else, it, it made sense. It's still like right now doing this interview with you. It's actually not that bad. It's great. You know, and mm -hmm. the fact that we have some people from different parts of the city or whatever tuning in. It's, it's great. It's actually opened up a whole new way of collaboration and so on, right? So uh, that's what kept us going. We Sure, we did a few gigs. We did some corporate gigs, uh, online streaming. We did our first public online streaming gig last week. Uh, but few and far between and not something that we could depend on to say that, yeah, this is going to pay our bills for the next, you know, for the next six months, the next year. Uh, so in something like this, having that alternative really, really helped. And mm. so if you are, you know, if you're a dancer, then maybe you have to learn how to teach dance online. If you're a, if you're an artist, then you need to come up with a different way to uh, to to get value for your art, which may be painting or photography or sculpting or whatever else. You need to find a way to monetize your skill uh, in this new world, right? And and as the, as the person most involved with that art, you have to really sort of examine it and see, okay, what part of it maybe is the one that I can monetize. Other parts may not be monetizable, whatever, right? So, and it's about that. It's, it's about that exploration. It might take you a few months to figure it out, but if you don't, if you're not open to it, if your mind is not open to the fact that you need to completely reinvent yourself, then you're in, you're, you're, you might be in a bad place. When a child or a youngster gets into the music industry, what is the one big misconception that they have? Mm. It's usually not just one. <laughs> okay, what are the many misconceptions that they have? <laughs> uh, uh, well, there's uh, from what I've seen of uh, because most of the people we employ are you know millennials. They're all in their early twenties, so they've grown up um, with the reality of the internet with the reality of online collaboration, with the reality of streaming, with the reality of, they've grown up with that stuff, hmm. right? So, um, while those, those, those methods of collaboration and of sharing have made things easier on, at, at, at one level, they've also made things very, very difficult at another level, hmm. right? So you need to have the right priorities, right? Hmm. So are you going to become a social media guru, which means that you are, you are, you know how to work Instagram, you know how to work Facebook, you know how to do that. Or are you actually going to be a really good artist, hmm. really good musician, right? And where's that balance? You can't say that you will only be a good artist and not a, good, a social media guru. You have to find a way to do both. Hmm. Uh, so priorities, I think, is a very important thing to get right, right? Hmm. Which is that. If you want to be an artist, then your priority should be your art. You should be, you should be really working at getting really good at what you do, right? Mm -hmm. And you also need to understand how to market yourself. You need to understand how to push, how to do all those things. But you can't place too much emphasis on that. So mm -hmm. that misconception that if I market myself really well, uh, then it's fine. Even if my art is not that great, you know, I'll be successful. Right. You might achieve some degree of success by, as a result of that, but it's not honest and after a while it, it tends to you know in my experience it tends to fade 
because mm-hmm. you don't have the core uh, strength of having something that you are really really good at right. Right? right and then you have to build the other stuff around that if you build just the outer shell and the core is kind of weak then at some point you will fail Right. right so get get that priority right i think that's one big thing um secondly i'd say this um you know increasingly we talk about this thing called the gig economy yeah i'll just go from gig to gig and you know i'll just do something for a short time and then i'll do something else for some other time there's nothing in truth wrong with that and if in the new world we live in the new realities we are uh, uh that we have right now it actually makes a lot of sense to have uh a life and a career built around something like that which is you know not this old traditional thing about oh i'm committed to one job for 30 years at the end of that i will get my gold watch and i will go home you know that kind of it does, that doesn't exist anymore right uh, and so with given this kind of gig economy that we live in right now uh don't get you know there, there's this thing that um just because i can move from one thing to another without having too much commitment mm-hmm. right that same lack of commitment or the lack of uh, of stability at one level cannot be something that you have with your art as well right you've got to be committed to that mm-hmm. right and and that no matter what you say is your lifelong pursuit if you really want to do that it's your whole life man it's not okay i'm going to do this for 5 years and then i'll try something else mm-hmm. i mean that might be something you want to do yes but if you if you really get into music uh, as an example you realize that after 24 years i'm still scratching the surface Hmm. I know that there is still a mountain of stuff right. I have to learn, right? right? I'm still, I'm still, you know, a child trying to understand the, the enormity of what I have taken on, right? And and you do, and you know, as any, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, if you're a lifelong learner, you know that the more you learn, the more there is left to learn, right? Yes. <laughs> and so it's it's a humbling experience. So accept that humility. Accept the fact that you will always be a child at this, and you are you have to commit to doing it. for the rest of your life right? right whether you do it to make your bread whether you do it as a hobby whether you do it as a side passion all that is is different but it's a lifelong thing just right. accept that it is not something you do for a few years then you are never really serious about it it is just something that there's a passing thing right now you have an academy and you're probably seeing a lot of kids who are uh, starting off with their careers or they learning music what is the one mistake you see parents make or are there many again <laughs> <laughs> no actually with parents uh, we've seen a market shift in uh, in general attitude across the last 10 years that we've run the academy you know uh, back in 2010 2011 we still have parents coming and saying uh, yeah yeah you know my son is very interested in this guitar and all but it's only up to 10 standard after that uh, he's got to get three years of studies then he has to you know prepare for his uh, boards and uh, so it'll only be this much and just some just to give him some relief you know from his studies and all that uh, so that used to be pretty much the attitude uh but across the last 10 years we've seen more and more parents coming and saying look this 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 girl is just crazy about playing music what do i do you know what what next and so we give them the kind of advice that you know or the kind of uh, we we have a talk like how we're doing right now saying that yes it's complex it's not a black and white thing and it's many it's multi dimensional so it's good that you know uh so if your daughter really wants to be a piano player and she wants to play that as a career fantastic so give her the best possible education with the piano that you that you can afford right uh, but also educate her on other things educate her with you know developing a work ethic uh, understanding the industry understanding marketing understanding finance understanding because as an artist you need to understand these things you need to know how to work with other people so make sure you get basically you need to give your child the best mix of things that allow them to succeed at what they want to do right mm-hmm. it can't be one dimensional especially in today's world because it's so complex it's so mm-hmm. multi dimensional it is it is not as simple as it was say 50 or 60 years ago where there there is a path and you follow that path and you know uh, even there it is complex but it's even more complex right now mm-hmm. right so uh, so that's the thing so sometimes what happens is you know parents get um, kind of okay piano so let's go to berkeley you know i uh, we are we are we are we are wealthy enough to say we will pay 50 lakhs a year to send our child to berkeley and she will go to there and she will have five years of the most amazing music education known to man and mm. she will come back and she will be an instant superstar doesn't work like that mm. right so because just going to berkeley doesn't guarantee you anything it just guarantees that you will have a great musical experience 
right? right so there's a lot of other stuff <laughs> there so maybe you want to do berkeley a little later maybe you want to have some work experience first maybe you want to learn about other things that help you uh, make your make your career in music maybe you want to understand social media and marketing maybe you want to understand graphic design maybe you want to under- because all these things will help you shape that career in music later on mm-hmm. right so again holistic think broader right it's great that you have the wherewithal and the attitude to say that i'm going to encourage my child to do what her heart really wants to do but mm-hmm. also give them that perspective that you have as an adult as someone who has worked for a large part of your life to provide for your family that mm-hmm. thing about hey there are other things right there are things you need to understand about work mm-hmm. and money and and all that that are mm-hmm. going to help you with your career right so let it not be one dimensional so your support should also be holistic right mm-hmm. and you know and as long as you communicate this to the child well they understand they understand that hey i am getting a chance to study what i really love but mm. to to have some to have the best chance of success and doing what i love the other things i need to know right mm. and and so and therefore you know i sometimes that motivational factor of i am actually doing what i love but these are things that are going to help me do what i love is enough for them to study things that they might otherwise say why am i learning this why are you putting me it's like it's right. you understand there's there's a means to this end right mm. and so yeah have that broader perspective be more holistic in your approach and you'll be able to support the child better okay i have a few last two questions uh, so the first since you're doing a how to pursue music uh, musical career thing my question to you is how do i book my first gig how do i find my first show how do i do that because as i've studied i've learned i've done all of this now how do i go out there you need a network right and that's again that skill about you so uh, like for example <clears throat> you join tech academy now tech academy is uh, we have you know 800 students so uh, and at least pre pandemic one of our biggest usps was getting students together to jam right and giving them opportunities to perform live in front of an audience so uh, and sometimes we take these shows to public spaces like malls or venues or things like that right Uh, and sometimes have other musicians featured there professional musicians who are in the in the scene for many years they perform and so on so with this kind of thing especially that uh, that people skill of actually being unafraid to walk up to somebody who senior to you and just ask questions right and say hey uh, i really i like what you did so much can you tell me a little bit about this and most people are quite happy to share you know there are of course people who will be like you know not not want to talk to a kid but those are rare right most people <laughs> are quite happy to and they're so happy that someone is asking them for you know valuable advice that people are you will find more often than not and people are willing to share because the moment you ask someone for advice they already feel good right like wow okay <laughs> you you think i'm cool so yeah i'm going to give you some advice <laughs> you know so you got to be shameless you got to ask you got to ask questions you got to feel like a fool sometimes asking things that seem to be transparently obvious to everyone but you don't know it right you have to network you have to and you have to be you have to be almost shameless in your self promotion saying hey i've got this here's my cd you know i've got uh, this is what i recorded at home on garage band this is what i this is my demo tape right listen to it please tell me what you think they might never listen to it whatever but they're going to remember that kid who walked up to them and said give them a demo tape and said i'm really and say hey you know that kid's got he's, he's getting into the hustle right and yeah. this word hustle is very important here it's a hustle you have to hustle you have right. to like make contacts you have to talk to people you got to ask questions you got to go and insinuate yourself inside conversations you got to you got to jump on things there's an event say yeah i'll come and play for free no problem i just want to play right and then slowly like that you know you develop uh, the skill to to get to a point where some somebody says hey i you know i remember that kid you keep play there let's get him to play let's get him to open for us let's get him to open for another band that's you know happening Right. that's how it works and the one thing leads to another and eventually after a while you're like hey okay i've got my own thing now and uh, you know people are calling me and i'm telling them what my price is suppose i don't see success as a performer not everybody is a successful performer what yes. are the other options that i have in the music industry i still love music i still want to be in the industry what all can i do if you love music and if you uh, really love the art form itself teach hmm it's one of the most satisfying things of, of course you have to uh you have to sort of like being a teacher if you hmm. hate being a teacher then don't teach because you want to ruin uh, <laughs> you know your students lives by <laughs> by your bitterness at, of not succeeding with music and transferring that to them uh but if you like teaching and if you like that whole process of collaborating and transferring this love for music that you have then you must teach which is why i do it i love teaching i love uh, right. sharing this knowledge i love 
uh, you know, and especially I love working with students who don't find music easy. Right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes working with students who have a natural gift and who are, you know, pick up things really, really fast. It's great. It's great fun. But after a while, you're just kind of, kind of pointing them in the right direction while they're doing all the running themselves. Right? So, mm-hmm. but getting a student who can't pitch, who can't keep time, who uh, doesn't listen to the right kinds of music, or who, who seems very kind of, it's difficult, you know, it's difficult, it's not happening easily. Now, working with a student like that and getting them to a point when they can perform on stage or they fall in love with the instrument they're playing and then they've got a lifelong friend, now, that to me is you know, much more satisfying. It's like, you really made a difference to that person, right? So the ones who are already very talented, yeah, you might have made a difference, but it's a smaller difference because you just one more stepping stone for them, right? So, so that's one thing you can do. Um, you can. There are lots of other things. You know, if you're a, if you if your performance is didn't become your thing, uh, you can go behind the scenes. You can produce. You can help other musicians produce. You can help people record. You can you can have you can offer creative input on their productions. You can work in the production industry. You can work in radio stations. You can work in event management things. You can become a sound engineer. Uh, you can become a sound designer. Uh, you can make music for video games. Are, right now, the opportunities out there are truly staggering. Right? Mm-hmm. If performance is not your thing and you want to try something else, there are hundreds of avenues you can explore. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, like I said, in all these different industries, there's, uh, there's the information dissemination industry, streaming, things like that. There's the event production industry. Uh, and there's, of course, the 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 teaching and the performance industry. So performance is not your thing. Maybe, maybe teaching is your thing. You're teaching is not your thing. Maybe events and production is your thing. If that's not your thing, maybe working in, uh, in, in a record label or working in a streaming company is your thing because at least you understand music, right? And uh, uh, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be better qualified to, uh, uh, you know, to accept or, or, or make a top 10 chart than someone who doesn't understand anything about music. Right? right. So you have those those qualifications help the fact that you play music, understand music, can really help you do better at those jobs. Hmm. So there's a question from Kiran. Uh, are there any educational requirements yeah. to be a sound engineer? Uh, not education requirements. There are definitely knowledge and perspective and information requirements. Uh, there are many uh, schools right now where you can get these qualifications. There's uh, uh, a couple in Bangalore. There are many in outside outside the city. There are many abroad where you actually go and study audio engineering, production, things like that. Uh, there are also plenty of audio companies, you know, sound reinforcement companies in the city where you can go and intern with. I did that uh, in uh, when I was in my final year of, of my master's degree. I went and worked in Reynolds, which is one of the biggest audio equipment suppliers in the, in the, in the city. I went and worked there for six months. And my first job there was carrying speakers. I wasn't engineering anything, right? But so I learned from the ground up in terms of, okay, how do you set up a PA system? How do you wire it up? What is a power amp? What is bridging a power amp? What is a crossover? What these are things that you know? Uh, I find myself really even now using that information is very valuable, right? And very recently, uh, I was working with a sound engineer who had been to you know a fancy sound engineering school, and we happened to be at an event where uh, the PA system was set up wrong. It was not set up correctly, and it was just sounding really, really bad. And this engineer, while he was while uh, he was a good engineer, uh, makes things sound good couldn't understand what was going wrong and was trying to fix it the wrong way, you know? And then uh, after a while, I was like, okay, something is, 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 is fundamentally wrong here. And, and thanks to that, whatever six months of thing that going behind the speakers and saying, oh, okay, great. The wrong amps are hooked up to the wrong speakers. This crossover is, 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 is selected wrong. And then boom, suddenly it works, right? Mm-hmm. So sometimes that fundamental understanding is not easy to get from a course. Because the course focuses on, okay, you're an audio engineer, so then, yeah, let's look at digital audio workstations. Let's study Pro Tools. Let's study Logic. But do you know what a waveform is? Do you know what frequency is? Do you know what uh, uh, what an amplifier does? Those are fundamentals, right? And sometimes the fundamentals, if they're not strong, hmm. all the other knowledge sometimes is kind of floating. You know, you don't have that base. And so, yeah, apprentice at a sound reinforcement company, learn the fundamentals, learn what an amplifier does, what is a vacuum tube, what is a transistor, you know? And if you're passionate about this stuff, you learn it, right? Mm -hmm. And then that's knowledge and information that's going to serve you well, uh, uh, whatever your qualification is later on, right? So there are tons of places where you can study and there are tons of places where you can experience. So do both. Uh, uh, Bruce, as Hoopsters, League of Action Hero, one of our main programs that you're planning to take to schools is something called art appreciation. It's not an art class. It's an Great. art appreciation. Fantastic. So why, why do you think something like this would be important for not just the non, 
people who may not get into an artistic cycle, you know, career, but also for those who, um, the ones who are probably going to give us jobs tomorrow as artists. No, it, 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 is, it, artists? Is, it is supremely important to have these kind of things because this is what I was talking about. This is the aesthetic. And hmm. this is what places value on art. Hmm. If only someone is educated about the value of art saying, can you imagine what went behind the creation of this piece of music or this piece of art? What was the historical perspective? What is the context in which it was created? What is the relation? What is the contrast? What is the balance? What is the, if you understand that, then you start seeing, wow, there's a lot that goes into this, right? And then you start having this, this is worth something. This is not something that I just consume for free because Spotify gives me a free tier, right? <laughs> it's like, it's not, it's not free. It shouldn't be free. There's, there's a value to this. It's adding right. value to my life just by right. the fact of me studying it or listening to it or experiencing it, right? So uh, it's, I think it's truly the most important aspect of arts education, appreciation, developing perspective and context when it comes to appreciating art, right? So for the most part, you know, when we grow up, we gravitate to peer pressure. Somebody tells you a song is cool, so you say, okay, it's cool, hmm. right? Or if the most popular uh, girl in class is listening to this song, everybody's listening to that song. Mm -hmm. Do they have their own understanding of what is making that song so popular? Do they have their own context? Do they have their own perspective? Do they have their own uh, knowledge and experience to say, hey, yeah, I, this song is cool, but I think it's actually quite derivative and it's not really you know, original or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you say that? You can only say that if you have the right education, if you have the right context, if you have the right perspective, if you have this appreciation where you have the information necessary to actually objectively understand the merit of art. Right, right. Uh, now, I'm going to ask you one question. I, it's very difficult for most people to answer this. Can you tell us one memorable moment as a band? Because I'm sure every show has its own memories. But as a band, what is like one moment that you can never, never forget? <laughs> uh, I mean, several. But I have to say, one of the first ones was when we opened for Deep Purple here in 2001. Wow. Um, that was our kind of, you know, lucky break. You know, <laughs> suddenly we went from being a band that no one knew to being a band that, oh, they opened for Deep Purple, you know, and then our first album we released at the same time. And then, you know, that kind of put us on the map in a way, right? Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, Terminal Recorder, what is that? Oh, Terminal Recorder? What, what, what does it even mean? You know, it became a conversation starter. It became a, oh, th three mullus and a quarter mullus. Ah, <laughs> what a funny guy. You know, <laughs> this kind of nonsense uh, started because of that, right? So it's useful to get that break. It's useful to get that one thing that just suddenly, you know, takes you from where you were to somewhere different. Uh, don't expect it to happen all the time. When it happens, uh -huh. seize the moment, <laughs> live it, <laughs> really kind of. Uh, so yeah, getting up on that stage in front of 30,000 people and uh, playing our own music and then having, you know, Steve Moss from the band come and shake your hand and say, I liked what you did keep doing that stuff. Yeah, those are things you don't forget and those are things you cherish for your whole life. Now you remind me of one question. Why thermal end of water? Is something I want <laughs> <laughs> You want the short story or the long story? As much time as you have. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, can, I can sit here all evening. <laughs> now, the short story is yeah, when the band began. So the name was basically concocted in about, I've, I don't know, two or three minutes backstage. <laughs> Uh, at Autumn News, uh, 1996, uh, the St. John's uh, Medical College, uh, uh, you know, cultural festival, where they had a semi-professional category of band competition. And so we had to have a band name. We couldn't go as Christ College A team, you know, <laughs> which was like <laughs> the most unoriginal thing you can think of anyway. So, um, uh, so yeah, we had this uh, band and so the bass player, Chuck called Sunil Chandi. He was fond of making puns and so on. He still is, by the way. And uh, so, yeah, the band at that point was uh, comprised three Malayalis, uh, you know, from Kerala. And mm -hmm. I was calling myself a quarter Malayali because one of my grandparents had some you know, roots in Kerala or whatever. So, it was a quarter Malayali. So, it became, you know, three Malus and a quarter Malu, Thermal and a quarter. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were joking. That's, that's the real story. Okay. That's the real story. That's a short story. Uh, we've got we got very tired of telling the story over and over again across the last 24 years to reporters who would ask us the same question no matter how many times they had seen it on Google. <laughs> so that we started coming up with different stories every time. So oh, 
and that's where the word tacademy also comes from thermal quarter becomes tac because you know thermal quarter is a bit of a mouthful so it just becomes tac most people just call us tac you know that band tac yeah. and uh, so you know tac academy so it became tacademy which is also tacademy which is also you know right. so we love all this kind of you know slightly <laughs> <laughs> Like a double take kind of, huh? What is that kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is interesting. It's always a conversation start, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my last question to you would be, Bruce. Now, uh, with the industry like this, there is no end to learning, like you said. Yep. And sometimes we are not lucky to have mentors who can push us through. You know, not everybody is yep. lucky. So how do you? What What is the process of self education? How do you keep learning? yourself if you don't have a band to support you for a solo artist for example how do you keep yourself up to speed with the industry a good question really um first i mean try and find the right mentors uh it's really important that you do that so don't resign yourself to the fact that oh i haven't found somebody so i'm never going to find somebody uh, it's not a good thing and it might lead to a very kind of inward loop of uh, of your own creativity in sense after you don't have enough feedback coming from outside and you don't know how good or how bad you are right mm-hmm. so you you know i we are social animals and we need that kind of validation not just from our audience but also from peers and from mentors and from people who are better than us at what uh, we do right so keep looking for teachers at all points of your uh, career like right now my teachers uh, there's a guy in calcutta called amit datta who i look up to as a guitar player and while obviously we're not in proximity every time i meet him i am sitting with him and learning i'm just picking his brain and asking him how he thinks about something i steal his ideas all the time and you know i'm using them in my in my compositions in my own way whatever so he's an example of a mentor for me uh, a, a real mentor virtual mentors youtube right now is an incredible resource for some of the best musicianship you can find right so uh it can be an ocean you don't know what to look for but again ask your peers ask your friends look at you know the kind of styles that you are into and try and find people who are doing stuff that is exciting to you or interesting and you learn from them right so uh having that guidance having those sounding boards having those people who are unafraid to tell you that you suck are uh, very important right so uh, find mentors don't ever resign yourself to the fact that i can't find a mentor there are always mentors out there look for them find them Right. Thank you so much, Bruce. So that was all I had to ask you. But before I finish, do you remember the anthem you made for us? Oh yes, beautiful city. Yes. Do you remember a few lines? <laughs> oh, actually, no. It's been way too many years now. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, um, Academy, the kids at Academy wrote, composed, and performed this entire track. It is called the Dream City, my Dream City, and it's. Um, the hoopsters anthem now so to listen to it and to see the great job that these kids have done log on to hoopsters.in and if you want to youtube it just say dream city academy and you will see what these kids are doing that was that song was such a hit you know i mean everybody loved it i think stella really i'm great i'm glad i mean we just kind of facilitated there were these two kids who wrote uh, some of the lyrics and then a little bit of the melody i just came in and kind of shaped it uh, didn't really do much in terms of trying to make it my song it was not it's not my song it's a kid song right? right i just kind of helped it along and shaped it in a way that's all so uh, yeah it's great fun working on those projects and that's we do a lot of that at academy even now uh, mm-hmm. because of the fact that we ourselves are you know musicians that make our own music that's very strong in our culture in the sense that we want to inspire our students to to do that to write their own thing express themselves write their own music create and with the tools available now you know technology it's so easy it's so uh, convenient to do things you just need a computer a phone you can do so much with all of that you know yeah. so that's really some of the some of the key things at academy that uh, uh, that drive us and you know and the fact that uh, from the beginning we been more about that uh, the musicians uh, you know you for a long time you know accountant was a musician right so the whole place is if you are run by musicians we are run by musicians so it is that really that what drives us and that's uh, i think that's important all right thank you bruce thank you so much so for the audience if you are still looking for information about how to start a career in music or where to get started check out tag with me please contact them thank you very much for that to them and uh, to showcase your talent to showcase your musical talents and any other talent that you have log on to hoopsters.in we have an online talent hunt contest going on right now so please take a look at that 
and that job rocks will keep bringing more shows for you we're trying to get you in tune with all the alternatives that you have so you can have the career of your dreams and you can <laughs> help your kid do the same <laughs> yeah all right thanks bro so thanks nice very much you. nupur thank, thank you. you thank you everyone Such for pleasure. signing in yeah yes. take care of yourselves stay safe have a good holiday season and uh, hopefully a better 2021 yes that's the hope <laughs> <laughs> what right. a time to live through huh? what a time yeah. to live through take care everyone yeah thank you bye 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 guys thank you so much